So this is Burma, the Forgotten War, 1943 to 44, which arrived uh, a week or so ago in C3I magazine. Uh, the first time I've bought C3I magazine as I begin my, or continue my return to wargaming. Um, and uh, it came with a uh, fully fledged um, standalone game set in the Empire of the Sun uh, environment, I suppose one would say, um, focusing on Burma, the conflict in Burma. And the reason I'm really pleased about this is because I have on order through the GMT P500 uh, the full Empire of the Sun game, which at some point soon, I think, is going to start making its way across the Atlantic to me here in Wales, in the UK. Um, and what's great is that that's clearly a big game, but this is going to give me a chance to explore the system in a very narrow uh, geographical uh, part of the full game um, with a kind of limited number of pieces. Um, it was quite dense in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the units in this small area, but uh, obviously not many uh, naval pieces. Um, but anyway, a good chance for me to learn the system, perhaps not full all its complexities, uh, but you know to get a sense of the key points, the uh, notion of zones of influence, supply, activation, uh, how conflict uh, and operations work. Um, and I'm really looking forward to giving it a, a go. Um, it's a short four-turn scenario, you know, with only a small number of cards in each hand per turn. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to getting a sense of the uh, Empire of the Sun method and, uh, uh, and model. So let's see how this one goes. Now, this scenario explores the conflict in Burma, referred to as the Forgotten War. Um, the Allies um, ha um, didn't put the greatest logistical priority on this, um, and uh, the uh, useful notes that come with the game note that um, the Allies cancelled a number of amphibious lift and uh, offensives um, but that for the Japanese Burma was a logistical back door into China. Um, uh, in 42 the Japanese captured Burma and closed the Burma Road which is represented here this road up from Rangoon into Kunming um, which was an important supply of international aid to uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, and his army within China. Um, the Allies then committed to maintaining an aerial supply line to Kunming over the Himalayas, over northern India, um, which uh, a route that became known as the Hump. Uh, the justification for this resource uh, expensive effort being that it would tie down the bulk of the Japanese army in China and prevent its redeployment into the Western Pacific. This uh, uh, aerial pipeline could never replace the tonnage that would uh, have come in through an overland route, the old Burma Road. So in 43, the Allies under General Stilwell began an offensive designed to recapture northern Burma, this area up here, while constructing a new what's called Lido Road to connect over land with Kunming. So Lido uh, coming up here through Jahat and then into northern India. So kind of replicating uh, the overland route of the old Burma Road. So what we're going to see is uh, a conflict around these key sort of logistical routes with the uh, Chinese, uh, the Japanese, the yellow pieces, uh, trying to uh, close the hump or ensure that the Burma Road 1 isn't lost, but also the Lido Road up around the top uh, doesn't open. And at the same time, doing its best either to uh, send politically China into uh, sort of chaos and collapse, or uh, provoke um, an uprising in India that would uh, uh, lead to the distraction of the 
British forces as they sought to reassert control over their uh, still colonial um, uh, Indian Raj uh, that of course wasn't going to last long. So what we're going to see is fighting over in terms of key points um, some of the key tracks around the Chinese stability and Indian stability uh, whether the Burma Road can be opened control of Rangoon is going to be important uh, and whether the Allies can get one of these key strategic routes opened or not that's where the key points are going to come from um, and uh, no doubt that is where the bulk of the conflict is going to take place uh, neither side has many pieces I mean there's not a lot of reinforcements or uh, you know some replacements to come in there's a few naval pieces you can see uh, uh, some British pieces here off map in Singapore some Japanese ships but predominantly this is going to be a land conflict um, but nonetheless uh, I'm hopeful that it will uh, give me a good ground uh, you know good grasp and grounding in the uh, basic rules of the wider Empire of the Sun game right so first turn it's actually game turn six we're in May to August 1943 the summer of 1943 um, we skip through the reinforcements there are no reinforcements to come in those that would come in uh, later on um, so we move to the replacement segment now I'm assuming that the uh, normal replacement chart is replaced as it were by the special rules which gives allied replacements one commonwealth ground step per turn um, the Chinese one ground step on turn seven and nine that's uh, the next turn and one air step per turn and one naval on game turn nine so the allies are going to get one ground step and one air step in this turn so uh, looking at it that will restore this ground unit the engine um, which uh, was currently was um, initially reduced but uh, now comes back up to full strength and I don't know if there's a reduced air unit in there let's have a look nothing there nothing there so that air replacement and you'll see I'm going mad is not used and is lost so uh, move to the Japanese um, the Japanese get two air replacements at the start of the game which I think has to last them throughout um, and they get some three um, events I think what I'm going to do I mean we've got to use these two air replacements for the entire four turns so what I think I'm going to do I think this air unit I'm going to bump up to full strength right from the beginning because I think uh, there's no point hanging around to wait to see if it's uh, uh, survives okay let's reduce that down so we have one air replacement left for the Japanese uh, for the remainder of the game and that is the end of the replacement phase so we skip effectively the uh, strategic warfare segment um, largely because um, that has the impact normally of reducing hand size um, but the scenario special rules say that um, that restriction only kicks in at seven turn seven eight and nine in turn six um, the allies uh, draw four cards and the Japanese draw three and then choose an additional fourth military event for a future offensive card so that can you know it's uh, can be used um, in the forthcoming turn or, or held over um, and the Japanese can go first by playing a military event as an event so 
for example, that future offensives card could be used if the Japanese don't have any other um, um, military um, events in hand. Um, now, I have selected, I'm going to show you, I've selected um, Operation uh, Yugo, um, fairly standard um, Japanese offensive card as the future operations. Um, I could have selected one, two others. I'm just going to show one that I considered, um, which looks, uh, you know, quite a tasty card, which is this um, um, Colonel Suji Unit 82, um, which is a surprise attack. And also uh, the bonus is that uh, in any ground combat that occurs in a Malaya jungle or mixed terrain hex for the duration of this offensive, the final die roll modifier for the Japanese in any ground battles is plus four, um, which is tasty. But the restriction is that only Japanese ground units may be activated. And I'm just slightly worried that at this point that if I throw in uh, the Japanese army unprotected at this stage without any air support, um, they could become a seriously degraded um, if the uh, Allies throw in a heavy um, air response, um, air reaction. So I think I probably want to hold on to that until... Um, the um, shuffle that deck until the um, allied air is to a certain extent uh, reduced in strength. Um, so I'm holding on, and I've played a, a sort of more, uh, one might say, mundane uh, future offensives card. So there we are, we have um, our hands drawn, just four cards in each hand, and uh, I think the Japanese are going to take the initiative, probably by playing um, an initial offensive. And we're seeing whether they can make some early inroads. So I am going to begin by using that future offensives card and um, using Operation Yugo, Burma Offensive, um, any HQ, well look, there's only one HQ and, and it's always activated. Uh, logistic value of four added to the one, so it's five units activated, only air and ground units may be activated. Now, having studied this and having played one test turn, um, before I set uh, uh, this up, um, I've discovered that you can, you know, be a bit foolhardy, pile in, and uh, find yourself absolutely decimated very, very quickly. So I just want to avoid that. And as the Japanese, the Japanese are in the lead already. They own Rangoon. They've got the Burma Road closed. That's a five-point advantage already. So I don't see that the onus is on the Japanese necessarily to be um, uh, gung ho about this. So I'm going to use. I'm going to. Uh, Obviously activate the South HQ here and I'm going to just do some uh, maneuvering of these air units. I want to get them closer to the uh, action at this point. So I'm going to activate one, two, I can't do that of course because that's we've got inter-service rival which means I can only activate um, either naval and that's a naval unit, naval or ground, so I'm going to have to just activate ground units, so that's one, two, I think that third one here, um, and then now there's not a lot of us that I can really, I mean I could activate the ground units here, but I'm not sure I want to be moving them from where they are, um, and I've got, in terms of, I've got an air base here, an air base in that Lashio here, and an air base up in Yitkina. So I'm, I'm going to leave my line of uh, ground units there. I'm going to leave some presence, land presence, in Rangoon, because I do need to hold on to Rangoon. And all I'm going to do is I'm not going to declare a battle hex. That um, I think. This strong air unit is going to come up to Mandalay. I'm going to defend Mandalay particularly. 
So that, that moves their one and two, no problem. Um, it's a three op card, so that's three hops, as it were. I don't think, I mean, the spaces and movement of that in this scenario is not going to be a problem because everything's so condensed. So one, two, three, up to Rangoon. I'm assuming Rangoon is a, an air base, yeah. Um, so I've got the hand fisted with the tweezers. So I'm going to bring this up and supplement that on a strong force there. I think that's a bit of a hub. And this one, I'm also going to move. And I think I'm going to, ooh, I'm going to bring that here. So. not declared any battle hexes, um, I've not moved any ground units, I just think it's, um, to be honest, too, too risky at this point. Um, obviously no, no naval units have moved, um, no amphibious assault, um, and so that ends the play of that card. The Allies make a timid opening move playing a War in Europe card just to shift the marker one space in their favour, meaning no delays in future to any reinforcements or replacements, but it's hardly a bold response to the Japanese initial realignment of their air force. The Japanese perfectly happy with how things are looking at the front and with the Allies making no dramatic moves, play the Japanese Army Navy Centre Agreement card to improve inter-service rivalry, flipping that over to the strategic agreement side. Play of the card comes with a bonus, allowing them to take back into their hand a card from the discard pile and they do just that by reclaiming Operation Yugo and sacrificing the US Joint Staff Debate card which simply shifts the inter-service rivalry marker. Seems a fair enough swap and gives the Japanese more military operations should they need so. So the Allies are up next and uh, I'm going to play this uh, single one-op uh, card um, which when combined with SEAX one logistical rating gives us uh, the chance to activate two units. Um, again not a huge amount that I'm going to do, but I want to bring this 33rd British, I think that's a core, is it? Um, closer to the action. So I'm going to activate them from, from, from this hex. Um, and let me just see what else I've got in there. I've got, no, it's two planes, so that, that's, that, that they can stay, they're, they're in range. Um, And what I might do is bring the Indomitable, because that has a range of two. So if I can bring that up here to, where is that? That is Dakar. Um, then that is also within any range of any future movements. So um, again, I'm not declaring a battle hex. I'm simply positioning or repositioning. So... I'm going to move the 33rd in here. That's my stacking limit. You can have three ground or air units or pieces in a single hex. And I'm going to bring the Indomitable across to Dakar for the second. And that just puts a bit of a... Well, I'm not sure how much it does change, but it just brings... Bit of naval presence closer 
um, to where I suspect the action is going to be. So that's that card played. Um, let's have a look at what the Japanese can now do. Um, mm. Again, I think they are going to use their turn. I mean, I can, one of the options is I can put this card down. It's a military card down as a future op, uh, future offensives card. Um, so that saves it for use in a future turn when I may have more use for it. I mean, I can't see where, as the Japanese, you want to really be launching an attack. I mean, I could take on this hex here, um, potentially just to to weaken them. But I think the risk is, I mean, I have got some good units. Um, and, you know, I've, I, I, I've massed the forces and maybe it, it, it striking a early blow now would be a good idea. I'm just worried about you know being overwhelmed from a 38 points of air to you know with the with to 24 i mean perhaps 24 33 i mean it's a sort of parity on the air and then we're looking at um slightly the luck of uh, of the uh role on the air naval uh combat results table uh, that can go one of two ways. Um, and as I say, I think for the Japanese at the moment, playing a political long-term game is, is as important as, as anything. And I don't see that with them being ahead because they have control of Rangoon and the Burma Road is closed. I'm not sure that they need to go chasing the game. So the Japanese are going to play that as a future offensives card. So we come back to the Allies. Um, so... Okay, I've um, moved things into place. So let's. Uh, let, let, I think now is time for a little bit of a conflict here. So I'm going to play this for a military event. Uh, it's a two op added to the SIAC one, means I can activate three. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's a logistic value of four with the SIAC, which gives four units can be activated. Uh, may only activate air and ground units. So having moved the Indomitable, the Indomitable is not going to be able to contribute. Um, I'm declaring that hex north of Rangoon as the battle hex. So um, I'm going to activate uh, one, two, three and then four five I'm slightly weak I'm, I'm slightly worried actually though I've kind of blundered there because uh, I'm slightly going to be outnumbered I think in terms of uh, the air so I'm not sure this is a very sensible because I, I, I can only, if I'm going to throw all of those in, in fact, I may just throw in 36 to 18. I'm going to just throw in the top two air uh, units. I'm going to leave the armoured behind. Um, um, I'm just trying to work out where I can, and then perhaps bring in this long range uh on one, two, three, that will come in at four and a half, five plus ten plus four, nineteen, and yeah, I mean it's not ideal, but I'm I'm going to go for it and see um see what happens. So we're going to activate one, two, three, four, and uh, actually, yeah, five. Uh, there we're within range. So that's the. Uh, those are the battle hexes. Now, the reaction player can cancel the offensive using a weather card if they have one. Um, uh, but that's not going to happen. Um, so, um, 
implement possible event bonuses from the offensive player's EC card. So during any ground battle, a combat in any battles initiated by this offensive, the allied player adds two to all ground combat die rolls for the duration of this offensive due to the assistance of the 5000 or the 5307th composite group. So that's going to come um, into use in a short while. Uh, a special reaction is not possible, um, but the reaction player attempts to change the offensive's intelligence condition by playing an appropriate reaction card. So changing it from surprise, and they're going to do that. They're going to play this uh, JN25 code change card, and that's going to turn it from a surprise attack into an intercept. Um, um, which is great. So then the reaction player activates and moves units to participate in battle hexes either declared by the offensive players or created by the special reaction. So uh, let's just move the uh, I'm going to move them in there that was the move there so reaction uh movement uh again they can re um the reaction headquarters is down here in the south and that's fine that can trace a, a line no problem it's in supply um so can activate um, so I suppose they want to bring in one these two uh, one two ah, now can I bring in a ground unit I'm wrong I apologize so that's going to come in so that's one two three four and they can activate a fifth and I suppose nothing to stop this one coming in as well it comes along the uh, um, I just got to check actually movement uh, if because it would come along the the, uh, the railway which would be a half a point. And I just need to check whether movement is... Oh no. A, a unit entering a hex that contains no enemy air or ground units via a transport route spends half a movement point. Um, but I think that means that if it enters a hex containing enemy units, then they lose the... Uh, benefit of so let me read that rule again a ground unit using ground movement um, uh, during reaction movement may move via a transport route but may not enter a hex using the transport route movement rate if an enemy ground unit is present so fine so this one uh, able to move two points yes it could move half a point to get into that hex but it would require an extra two points to move into here because there are uh, enemy uh, pieces in there so they cannot do that so that's the limit of the uh, reaction moves that can be made by the Japanese so it's got rather complicated um, but uh, sorry these two units this has moved in so one so let's get the uh, I'm going to just spread these out so these are the one, two, one, two, um, and then these are the two air units that the Japanese have activated, and these are the two air units, one, two, three. So Let's move first of all to the air conflict. So um, if we go through this one step at a time, the Allies have committed 
nine, but that's half because it's um, at extended range. So four and a half rounded up to five. Five plus 10 plus four is 19 points of damage. And the Japanese of air, of air strength and the Japanese have 30. So 19. We're going to roll a dice to see the uh, for the British uh, for the Allies. I beg your pardon. 19 at seven is one. Uh, let's just check that there are are there any uh, modifiers to that. Uh, it's not an ambush or a surprise attack. Uh, plus one. 1943 game turn onwards. Plus one for the Allied player if any U.S. air units are present. Well, there is one present. The this uh, unit up here. So that would bump it up to eight, but that is still just a times one. So that is 19 points of damage by the uh, allied air. Let's see how many points of damage, because it's an intercept, these are done simultaneously. Five for the Japanese. Now that's a half. Uh, there are no modifiers there so that is a half of 30 so that's 15 so the allies do 19 points of damage uh, the allies uh, the japanese do 15 so they are both going to take one so the allies are going to weaken the fifth air whatever division i need to check up on my terminology and I think the Japanese will weaken this SIAC but that is the limit of the damage they can't do uh, any further damage um, to the air so at the end of the um, uh, air combat we've applied the hits um, there are no critical hits, so we now have to work out who has won it. So both sides add up the attack strengths of the surviving units. Um, so at the end of this, the Allies have 9, 14, 19 points of air strength, and the Japanese have 19 points of air strength. Uh, the side with the highest is the winner. In case of ties, the reaction player wins, except if there are no surviving air or. Um... So if it's a reaction player victory, offensive ground units that entered the hex by amphibious assault do not take part in the ground battle and must later conduct post battle movement. Um, if the hex contains offensive ground units that entered the hex via ground, not amphibious assault movement, then immediately conduct a ground battle if there are ground units from both sides in the hex. Otherwise, there is no ground battle. So. Really, the aim of that was to ensure that neither side had air superiority um, over the other, but actually um, uh, it was a, a, a slightly um, um, pyrrhic, well, no, not pyrrhic, but a, a, a static sort of conflict. But there we are. That's where we are. So we now move to the ground conflict. Now, the um, Allies have this Vinegar Joe Stilwell bonus of plus two on the combat die roll. So we're going to come in a minute to the, uh, um, let me just uh, shift that so in, if you can see the uh, this table. So the Allies have 38, uh, uh, the Allies have 36 and the Japanese have 38, 47. Um, let's see the uh, modifiers, the offensive player, plus two if only the offensive player has naval units. That's not the case in the battle hex. And that's a reason why I should have brought a naval unit in. Um, that would have given me an advantage. OK, well, that's something for me to have learnt. Minus one if the defender is in a jungle hex. Well, we are in a jungle hex, so there's a minus one. And then the bonus for being the only person with a or player with uh, air units uh, remaining uh, is not triggered. That's why the air conflict was important. But when we take the plus two from the Vinegar Joe Stillwell, it's a plus one to the dice roll. And uh, there we are. So uh, that's, uh, oh, sorry, probably up just off camera. A zero for the uh, Allies. So that's going to halve their 36. That's going to cause 18 points of damage. 
um, the Japanese hmm, just as bad they've rolled a two uh, so they're halved as well um, so but they start with 47 that's going to do 24 points of damage so 36 18 the allies are going to reduce that Japanese unit 24 points of damage reduces both allied units and then the winner is determined by uh, which side lost uh, the uh, fewest um, steps well the allies lost two the Japanese won so the allies lost and must retreat so post battle movement send them back here I'm going to do a slight rearrangement now um, of the Japanese pieces I want to just they're looking slightly weaker now but despite all of that I don't want to leave Rangoon completely undefended so there's going to be a slight reorganization um, I think we'll keep uh, actually no I think Mandalay and so both sides slightly weakened um, but that's the uh, first piece of ground combat that we've seen. And I can discard that card. The Japanese have no cards left to play, so we come for the final turn to the Allies. Their final card in, can flip the Japanese into service rivalry and then draw a strategy card or we'll go for another um, but I think I'm going to wait to see what reinforcements do, whether that bolsters our forces. Um, we've still got a bit of time, but uh, don't want to dally. Um, so I think actually we will play that for the event. So they're going to play that for the event because it allows them also to draw a strategy card. And let's see what that brings. So flip that and draw another card. The final card the Allies have is another War in Europe card. Um, they could use it for an operation, but I'm, again, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I'm going to use it to just improve the War in Europe position. So uh, uh, if uh, at the end of the game the uh, marker is in the positive uh, zones, it's a victory point. So that might be worthwhile. Um, again, it's a slightly passive action, but it you know stores up a political point. It's not a bad way to uh, end things. So that is played as an event, and those are the cards. Um, and so at the end of the turn, uh, we have the political phase. Nobody's surrendered. Um, air ground units determine supply state. If they're out of supply, they're flipped from their full strength. They're reduced. Air and ground units already on their reduced side may be eliminated. Um, so the only units that I can see which are um, um, are these ch uh, ch um, Chinese pieces. So eliminate all reduced or single step air or ground units that are unsupplied and are not in a hex affected by an emergency supply route and are out of range of any friendly supplied or unsupplied HQ. For this check, enemy units opposing zones of influence and unplayable hex sides do not block the path. Oh, so fine. So that's important. For this check, enemy units opposing zones of influence and unplayable hex sides do not block the path between the HQ and the unit. So as long as they are that are unsupplied are not in a hex affected by and are out of range well they're not out of range of here so in that sense um, they remain so I don't think anyone is lost and that brings an end to turn one Shift that on to seven, and I'll be back again for that round at a later point.